Simon. Uh, Noah has been on the school board since 2013, January 2013, yep. and uh, school activist before that. And John Chadwick is the assistant superintendent for uh, facilities and operations. Thanks, Ginger. While John's setting up, um, I'll just be brief in some opening comments. Uh, first, it's great to see county colleagues here. Uh, Libby just stepped out, but um, contrary to what folks might think, we do talk all the time. John and I spent a good half an hour this week um, kind of going over the, the schools. I won't, I won't say 101. John is well versed in schools, so we're at about schools 501 level. Um, and Libby and I talk regularly, and that's how it is among the, the ten of us. So it is a good relationship. Um, I think see Greg Greeley here, who's running for school board, my friend, um, and uh, so many familiar school faces here, a lot of schools leaders. Um, I live a block and a half off of Lee Highway. My two kids go to Arlington Science Focus School, so these uh, I'm here both as sort of a board member and listening as a community member too. And Ginger, thanks to you and to the crew for the leadership putting this together. Just want to give some high-level things about the schools. Most of you are familiar with this, but it always sort of sets the tone for what we're going to see in the presentation and really drill down to why we were asked to be here. Uh, the school district is growing rapidly. Uh, the statistic I like to use, in fact, I like to point out is on the first day of school this year, we had 839 new students in our school system. Jefferson Middle School had 832 school students the first day of school. So we're growing at roughly middle school a year. Um, it's a good challenge, it's not a problem, it's a good challenge to have. As the Chief said, uh, other jurisdictions aren't doing as well as Arlington, um, and it's an attractive place to be. Uh, we have 4,100 employees, we're the second largest employer in the county behind the federal government, um, and we're proud of that. Uh, we are a people-based organization, 82% of our budget is related to compensation, both paying people in dollars and with benefits, and that's something we're proud of. Um, in terms of the things that are facing the board right now, there are four primary things that are in front of us between now and the remaining, hard to believe, nine and a half weeks till the school year ends. Um, the first is always instruction. That's what we're in the business of doing, is instruction. And if somebody from the schools ever gets up in front of you and doesn't talk about instruction first, um, we should um, sort of relook at that lens uh, because that's what we do. The second is transportation. Um, there is very little we do that we don't look through the lens of transportation. It affects everything that we do, from how our students learn, how our budget is done, our schools are driven by bell schedules, how many school buses, how many bus drivers, but it's so much more than that. Uh, transportation has a significant impact, as you all know, on the rest of the community. We have um, great support in the schools, but we have roughly 14% of our households that have school-age kids. So we understand that transportation affects the rest of the county. Um, certainly, uh, the next one is budget. We are in the middle of our budget process right now. The budget is roughly $540 million. Um, that's about a 3.8% increase from last year. The school board just adopted its, um, its budget from the superintendent, so we now own that. Some of the major things, the building that you're in right now, the delivery of instruction was um, going to be altered under the superintendent's proposal. That's not going to happen. It is a big number. I watch body language every time I say the $540 million. Um, I watch body language just now when I said that. I saw some people with eye movement and shoulder shrugging. I get it. That's a big, big number. The county government, through your tax dollars, gives us roughly 46% of locally generated revenue. So for every, 37, for every dollar that comes into the county, the schools receive 37 cents on that dollar. That's remarkable. We can't thank the county board and the taxpayers enough for that. We get what we need. We are able to provide instruction. The number one question we get about budget is why do we have the highest per pupil cost in, of the 16 local jurisdictions at roughly $19,000? It's because we pay our teachers more than anybody else. There might be teachers in the room right now or people who know teachers. We don't pay them enough. But because we're a compensation-driven organization with people, there are other factors that go into it, but it's primarily compensation. We don't like to always necessarily be at the top of the per pupil, but we're proud that we pay our teachers and our staff members, the 4,100 employees, the most. And the final piece that's in front of us is the CIP. It is fascinating being in the room with the chief. We are surrounded every day in the schools by heroes that are teachers. It's great for your service, chief, and for what your personnel do, um, other heroes in our community. 
but we're all, we're all looking for the same resources. We don't battle against one another. Schools and, and housing, affordable housing don't go head to head. Schools and fire don't go head to head. But being in a meeting like this and the leadership that Ginger's shown by bringing the group together shows that we have a common goal. We're not building new land. We're not creating more green space necessarily in Arlington. A new firehouse is needed, new schools are needed. So the collaboration piece of this is critical. John will get a little bit more into the CIP. We look forward to a short presentation and then really opening up for, uh, for discussion. So. Thank you. Before John just said, I just wanted to follow up. I wanted to mention that I invited some of our school leaders here today. So we have Gillian uh, Group. She's from Glebe, and she's past president, but one of our absolute top leaders. Jen Thompson is our current PTA president at Glebe. We have Pam Howes from Tuckahoe. Um, she is the president of the PTA at Tuckahoe. So we wanted to make sure that we had some school leaders here to also make sure that we keep no more silence. Thank you, Linda. Thank you, Noah. So I hope this is going to work, but um, this is uh, um, a presentation that I made to the CCPTA on Monday evening. So um, there have been some developments since then, and I will I will go through them as they as they are appropriate to the Okay, I'm going to have to ask somebody to press the uh, button. <laughs> Sorry. Can I just nod at you? Okay. 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 <laughs> okay. So we can talk a little bit about where our actual needs are. Considerations around the site, some options for those, and the next steps in our process. Um, I'm sure, I, I hope everybody's seen this already. Um, we've been um, showing this information really since, since October last year. These figures are based on our uh, September 30th enrollment. September 30th is when we say how many kids we have in the system, and all planning is really taken from that date. So we're looking in the top three are um, 2013, 2014, then we go down to 2018, 2019, 2023, 2024. So 2013, 2014 is where we were in September. Uh, 2018, 2019 is five years. That's much more accurate uh, in terms of enrollment projections than the second five years of the 10-year CFP horizon, obviously because we have better data to work for. So what we're looking at in uh, 2018, basically today, we are a little under uh, capacity at the elementary schools. But what I need to say is that the capacity numbers we present for the schools, they're much more fungible than we tend to think they are, because it really depends on the programs that we put in the school, how many students we can actually get in the school. And we're also finding that in terms of the actual numbers we present each year, the capacities of the school are probably a little under at the elementary schools. And uh, I'm sorry, the capacities at the elementary schools, the numbers are actually a little above what we can get in the school. And at the high schools, it's the other way around, and also in middle schools. So in 2018, 2019, we're looking at a 9% deficit of elementary school students, and a much higher percentage, 19% uh, middle school students. But when you look at the numbers, you realize that the actual numbers are higher in elementary schools. Remember, at elementary schools, we have seven grades. We have pre-K, K through seven. And at the middle schools, we only have three grades, six, seven. And then the high schools are beginning to show a deficit, uh, 806, um, which is a 13% deficit. When we get to 2023, 2024, the numbers are much higher. So we're seeing a 12% deficit at elementary school, which is 1,600 students, 31% deficit at middle schools, and then a 46% deficit at high schools. Obviously, the cohorts of students work their way through the system. The enrollment projections, though, are not showing any slowing down. <coughs> the growth is projected to continue at about three, between 3 and 4% a year for the next, really, an indefinite period. So we do have some site considerations. Um, it was interesting, yesterday somebody uh, asked me to check on what the state guideline is for a middle school. State uh, site, state guideline for a middle school site is 
10 acres plus one acre for every 100 students in the school. That would mean if we were going to do a 13 acre, uh, 1300 student middle school, we would require 23 acres. <laughs> Good luck finding that in Arlington, and if you can find it, there goes, <laughs> there goes our bonding capacity. So uh, clearly, um, waivers are permitted for uh, schools in urban areas, and it's expected, it's not even really an issue. However, given that site land is not available and land is very expensive if it was available, we really need to focus on APS owned sites and we need to continue collaborating with Arlington County Government obviously on available sites where we can share. Clearly though, um, working with our sites, we will, should be able to get the seats in place more quickly because there are many more stakeholders involved when we uh, collaborate with the county and that just will take probably at least a year longer to get the seats in place. Um, no options have been selected yet. We are still in this um, evaluation process, though we are narrowing it down, getting closer to some decisions. Um, we will, uh, our CIP the proposal that the superintendent makes to the school board on May the 8th, will include seats at elementary school, middle school, and high school. So we're recognizing that we need seats at every level, every articulation of our schools, and we are going to provide them. There is obviously, um, that's related to schedule, so the high school seats are needed later than the elementary and middle seats. The elementary and middle seats are pretty needed pretty much at the same time. And important to remember that no matter what options we select, there will remain relocatable classrooms. We need relocatable classrooms for quick short-term solutions. We will be putting, I think, four or five in this summer. We start on that now, and they're done by September. You can't build buildings that quickly. So we need them for speed, um, but we also need them for flexibility. Um, and we need them because we can't afford to build every seat that we need, and we probably shouldn't anyway, since um, uh, over the uh, you know over the cycle of Arlington schools, over the history of Arlington schools, the population's have always gone up and down, up and down. So we don't want to build more seats than. We need. Now let's take a look at possible options for addressing capacity. Um, from the uh, more detailed analysis, the elementary seats are most critically needed south of Arlington Boulevard. We are addressing them north of Arlington Boulevard with the new elementary school at Williamsburg and with the um, additions, renovations at Ashmore and McKinley. So we're looking at them south of Arlington Boulevard. We are collaborating with the county. We don't have a site identified for that second elementary school because the school board and the county have pretty much agreed that the site at Kenmore Collins Springs that was previously slated is just not a good option. It's not a particularly good option for us because it puts three schools on one site and it puts four schools on Collins Springs Road within about half a mile of one, which is an issue doesn't work that well for us because it's very remote. No, not very remote, but it's on the edge of the county. Almost impossible to create a neighborhood boundary. So we're looking for something that's more central, more adaptable. It's actually very difficult when you look at the uh, map of the attendance boundaries for the elementary schools south of Arlington Boulevard to find anywhere where you could create a new neighborhood school because they're so small and they're so close to one another, South Arlington being more more dense in terms of single family homes. So the first one is to have a new elementary school on a site to be determined, which we are working on with the county, and also including an addition at Abingdon. Abingdon was the, uh, <coughs> until we started, um, until our CIP transformed from being about capital improvements of existing facilities to constructing new facilities and expanding facilities to address the growth, which started around 2007. Uh, Abingdon was the, the, the school at the top of the list to be renovated. It does need a renovation, a small addition. It's also in one of the areas of tremendous growth. growth. So we are proposing that that be included in the, uh, that, that option. In fact, you'll see it's in all of them. 
Second option is to do additions at Abingdon, Henry, and Hoffman Boston. Third option is to do additions at Abingdon, Barcroft, Campbell. Uh, and then the fourth one is some other options. Also included in that is Arlington Traditional School because we were directed by the school board at a work session before spring break to reevaluate the ATS edition in this, this, in this round of um, CIP. You see that the net seats added um, are in this column, so it shows that in fact we get way more seats if we put in build a new school than if we do additions. It's also showing that the cost per seat is uh, more cost effective in, um, in, uh, in new construction. If you go to the um, our More Seats webpage, you will find these numbers are presented slightly differently from the community engagement meeting we had on Wednesday evening. And that's because we were looking at permanent seats rather than net seats. It's a kind of complicated calculation I don't want to waste your time with today. Um, John, but this would be related to construction solely. This doesn't get into like the transportation costs no. or things like that. So the net lifetime cost. Okay, the costs that are here are basically total project costs in the capital budget. So they include construction and all the soft costs and fees and permits and all of those things. They don't look at impact on operating costs. Um, you know, if we have a new school, we have a whole new administration, so that is a fairly large impact. Um, on the other hand, uh, as schools get bigger, planning factors give them more stuff. So it's not all that it seems. And uh, I mean, in terms of transportation, we kind of like schools to be local in neighborhoods, so transportation is limited. If it's going to be a county wide school, the best if it's near the center of the county so that we're limiting uh, transportation. Okay, next slide, please. So uh, the middle schools, um, we have five options here um, at the uh, school board work session on the uh, before spring break. The school board directed us to remove M2, which is the uh, Lover Run middle school option. Um, that's removed for a number of reasons. Uh, perhaps the most significant is that it's really hard to create a neighborhood school around it. Um, it's also some planning issues and some transportation issues and so on. It doesn't seem to be the right thing to do now. When we take these off, it doesn't mean they're off forever. We may come back later with a really good proposal for that site, but right now it doesn't really make sense uh, for us for a middle school. We've also taken off M3, which was the proposal to demolish the existing education center on uh, Quincy Street and uh, replace it with a middle school. Um, that is uh, uh, a very expensive option. Because not shown here is the cost of relocating our administrative office space, and actually that building also includes our technology hub. So um, that would incur uh, another cost of fitting up probably a leased office space to um, accommodate those functions, and then ongoing substantial lease costs which would affect our operating budget. Um, but again, that's something we might do in the future, um, that again, we could get a much bigger building where that building is a more efficient building. So again, in the future, that's something that may well come back. M1 is a new uh, middle school north of Arlington Boulevard. And uh, you may have, many of you, I'm sure, have heard that on Wednesday, the school board and county board issued a joint press release saying that that was now being considered as the site for a second school. So that's the um, Wilson Boulevard property where the existing Wilson School is. Uh, so we now do have a site for that, and that site will be considered in this, in this process. Um, that would be a, an urban model school that would be higher than schools we built before, and there would be some trade-offs between height and maintaining open space. General goal would be to try and keep about the same size of field as exists in the back there now. Number four is additions to four of our existing middle schools, um, Williamsburg, Dunstan, Swanson, and Jefferson. We have done feasibility studies. It is possible to add to all of those. 
when we did Williamsburg, we, uh, the new elementary school, they were very upfront with the community and made it clear that we were also planning for a potential addition there because we didn't want to go through all the traffic analysis and then come back two years later and say, oh, now we're throwing something else in. Um, Dunstan, Swanson, and Jefferson have also been looked at, and in fact, we could do an addition of Kenmore too if we ever needed to. Uh, to some extent, we can look at those numbers for middle school, and we may have to do some of these additions even if we build a new school or something. Uh, option number five is like a chess game, and um, uh, we're kind of lukewarm about that one. Uh -huh. That is, uh, let me see if I can explain. The first thing would be to consider renovating the Madison School so that the children's school could move to the Madison School. That's the children's school which is agreed. Then to um, renovate and add substantially to the Reed building to create a facility for H.B. Woodlawn. And then to move H.B. Woodlawn there and then to expand the existing building at H.B. Woodlawn to create a 1300 seat middle school which would obviously would relieve the the growth in uh, the Swansea and uh, Williamsburg schools. So that is a really complicated process. Uh, it would involve three enga community engagement processes. It would take longer. Uh, there would be, could be some overlap between construction projects, but it would definitely take longer. Um, and it is relatively expensive. The high school option, we really only have one high school option. <clears throat> what we found, we've done a um, very innovative utilization study of Washington Lee. Uh, we then took it the same methodology, uh, we had it done by an independent consultant. We then took the same methodology to Wakefield and Yorktown, and actually we've, we've done it for Swanson as well, to determine just how the buildings are being used and what efficiencies we can find. The study has demonstrated that um, Washington Lee, despite having a regular high school program, a AB program, and an IB program, does have room in the classrooms. We work on, school board has directed us to calculate the capacity of a high school based on each room being used six out of seven periods. The study shows that many of those rooms are not being used, maybe five out of seven periods. They're being used five, but they're not being used six. So we have some classroom capacity there. We, uh, we are going to work with the school on scheduling to help them give a little bit more help on scheduling because they're really complicated buildings. But the um, common facilities in the school, so the uh, gymnasium, athletic facilities inside the school, and the cafeteria, there is pressure on them from more students. So we have found that we can probably get between 250 and 300 more students in each of those high schools. That will take their capacity to um, around 2,200 from around 1,900. But at Washington Lee, we need to do a, a renovation project to make sure that we can use the building as efficiently and we address those common spaces in the building. So that will, the sort of things we would do in that would be to expand the cafeteria to uh, do some uh, work to expand the uh, interior athletic facilities, make them more usable, right-sized classrooms so we're not having a small class and a huge classroom, create teacher collaboration, professional learning rooms so that teachers aren't having to use their classrooms for preparation and they're in a more collaborative environment. So we are proposing uh, around between five and ten million dollars for an immediate project to make Washington League work better. We don't think we will have to do that at uh, Yorktown and uh, Wakefield. Um, they are not at capacity yet, and not projected to be at capacity for some time, but we're going to watch those and see if we need to do it. They were designed somewhat later in, they were the second and third of our high school rebuilds, so they are um, a little bit more flexible and thought of a little bit more flexibly in the plan. The, main uh, high school uh, option though, of course, if you could go back, I'm sorry, I wasn't waving at you, that, uh, is the uh, Arlington Career Centre. We believe the time has come to turn the Car Arlington Career Centre into a capacity generating high school. It's a huge opportunity 
to develop a really innovative, creative program that works for Arlington and Arlington students. So we um, are proposing their additions and renovations, uh, which would be preceded by a huge community engagement process around what that program is, um, and that that would take, you know, we would probably be finished, not finished with that for about six, six or seven years. And that will be, as I say, additions and renovations. Um, as you know, we are beginning to look at schedule and school day. Um, you see we've got a big uh, range of seats added. That's because that school will most likely have classes from 7 in the morning till 10 at night. And it will have a much more a flexible schedule. That means that we can get more students through that school. So that is with really the high school option. We can get a lot, a lot of capacity that way. We think it's a really exciting um, opportunity to um, move learning in Arlington forward. So um, we are continuing to engage the community to finalize these options. Um, we, the superintendent, will present this preferred uh, set of options for elementary, middle, and high school to the school board on May the 8th. Um, and they will, as I said, include middle school seats, elementary school seats, and high school seats. Uh, this is the schedule for that. Um, uh, correction on the May 21st joint school um, county board work session, that I believe is now on May the 20th. Uh, so we have all of these CIP work sessions. They are um, with the school board. They're open to the public, but the public doesn't participate in them. And we hope to get to action on the CIP on June 17th. Um, we have to make that date in order to uh, be in line with the county's uh, CIP process of which this is a part. Yes. Um, what I haven't said here is about the money. And uh, what I can tell you about the money is essentially um, we analyzed, we've analyzed our bonding capacity. We updated it um, from two years ago. It's presented in two-year chunks of what we can go for every every two years to keep under our 10% uh, maximum. And we can, um, it looks like we can afford the new construction op options, which would be E1, which would be a new elementary school out south of Wellington Boulevard, probably plus Abingdon, a new middle school uh, on a site, uh, most likely the Wilson site, and the high school option, which is the renovation of Washington Lee and the Career Center. We can afford those within our capacity over the next 10 years, but we can't afford them when we most need them. So in other words, they would be delivered later in the 10-year cycle than what we would prefer. So we will work with the county government, county board, to look at how we don't we uh, can adjust our bond capacity and take some uh, share it with them. Uh, and, however, it isn't just that. We need to talk to the county mm -hmm. about uh, the revenue share because if we bring those projects forward, we have more debt service than we currently can accommodate within the revenue share. So for the years by which we were advancing those projects, we would need to work with the county board to get more population projects. Your hand went up first. Yeah. Um, we have uh, one side who is at the top of the system right now saying that we're getting a dependent on the SIP plan meeting. So all I can say is thank you for the decision we made in terms of going with looking at existing facilities that like the Wilson School and we can do something with that because I think there's a lot of facilities and buildings and community centers that can still be used without brand new construction going in and having to put in a lot more capital costs and have to more bank for a month. I think this is just a great one in terms of how the county itself might be up going for the cycle in terms of kids coming and going through the system. So kudos to the board, school board and the county board for the decision that they made. Um, I think the career center seems like a, a, a great option to look at. I'm not sure about transportation, but that's been considered yet for a future high school and how that impacts it. Because right now, it seems like you know, it's going to be a bike, there's a couple of streets that feed it, 
is there any more insight you have on what could happen um, with the career center? Let me, let me just uh, say, go back to Wilson for one minute. Sure. The proposal is not to reuse the existing Wilson building. Right. But it is site, far too small to, to be right. used. But the site itself, which already yes. exists, which is... Yeah. Which is uh, right. In terms of transportation, um, I think I'd rather put that another way. There is nowhere in Arlington where we could put a school that people wouldn't be concerned about transportation. Nowhere. And it becomes, it, you can, it becomes an issue of local concern. It's like, we're concerned about our neighborhood, as you should be. The Career Centre site, from our perspective, is excellent. It's right next to Columbia Pike, where there's masses of public transportation. There's trans public transportation on Walter Reed, uh, there's public transportation on Glebe, which is only a few blocks away. The streetcar is fine. It's right where it should be. We would like to build schools, if we could, in the urban corridors or on the edge of them between, you know, the more dense parts of the county and then the single family parts of the county. So from our perspective, it's great. We can reduce, we hope we can reduce transportation from staff and from students in, in that location. Thank you. Mr. Kelly, sorry, could you go back to that very first slide that uh, indicates the populations? So when you see this, this is like standing on the corner of the, I mean on the, on the, on the edge of the shore facing a tsunami. <laughs> and, and, and you look at this and it's so intimidating and daunting, especially because I have a and I try not to personalize this, but I, as, a, as, a, as a parent of somebody who has a class of 22 and a class of 23 uh, at Yorktown, um, that, that is an intimidating number. I think the other thing that we know about from tsunamis is that once they pass, the seas return to the calm and you're floating around with all this detritus. I mean, my concern is that we plan appropriately for 2024, 2028, and then, when I was in fourth grade, and I, my neighborhood school was Reed, and it was closed. I think the question that I hear a lot is, are there third ways? Are there alternatives to what we're proposing here, which, you know, as children, as, as again, parent, a parent of somebody who will go to the new elementary school, everybody in Arlington likes new shiny things. We feel like we're entitled to them with our high property values, et cetera. But on the other hand, do we need to be doing all of this this way? Are there options? whether through leasing or through uh, flex space or even looking at some of these, you know, and I, I do not want to be marked for death here, but I mean, what is the greater good of ATS and, and, um, and HB Woodlawn versus the overall health of the entire school population, which while they are open to all students, they are open to small percentages of all students and yet have relatively large footprints. Why do some, HB, for instance, why does it need a traditional campus if it could be in Boston at Virginia Tech, at uh, somewhere where, where we could not necessarily have to spend even $60,000 per student? And it's a great question. As a board member and a parent who has a third grader with 26 in her class in the trailer, I can certainly feel it. From a board perspective, we have to look around the corner to figure out what's next. That's our job. Right? We can't do the day-to-day -day stuff. That's what the staff does. But we also have to look at what's in front of us right now as well. So the capacity issue, the challenge, is interesting. Because what happens is parents, parents and community members say, fix this problem, just not in my backyard. That's what we found out. And that's why we have a pretty robust community process. We certainly don't have all the answers to it. And that's why if folks do have thoughts about this, one of the ways that we hedge the bet is through trailers. John Blair calls them relocatables, learning cottages, whatever you want to call them. <laughs> My kids in one, all the trailer. It's not the end of the world. In fact, a lot of teachers actually welcome it. You have your own bathroom, it's quieter, you can control your own, own heat air conditioning. Those types of things. <coughs> what are the other options? We looked into lease space. For example, could we remove, could we relocate the HD Woodlawn program and per perhaps look at lease space because that program doesn't need everything else that a, a, a standard high school needs. However, they need a cafeteria and a gymnasium and staff lounges and things like that and suitable classrooms. And the leasing option was simply, it, it exceeded any type of money that we would, we would have. That became unattainable. 
But can we look at programs like, if we're looking at Wilson, and Wilson is attractive for a number of reasons, one of which is we don't have to pay for land, um, is it is also on a transportation corridor. So staff, parking, and things like that could be reduced. Um, but what happens if HB, perhaps, if we look at moving HB there? That's just an idea, a suggestion. What we have to look at right now is feasibility within the available resources, and then what programs go into it. One of the reasons you mentioned ATS, Arlington Traditional School, that we are now reconsidering doing anything at ATS is the impact at your kid's school, Pam's kid's school, is very minimal, where there's severe crowding. In this neighborhood in Farlington, where there's severe crowding, four and five kids. That's what we would tick off at those schools. That's not enough bang for the buck. We're reconsidering that. Can we take some of that bonding authority and put it to where the most critical need is? But again, I go back to the community process. We don't have all the answers, and if folks have suggestions, believe me, we want to hear them. For the Ashlawn project alone, there were 52 public meetings. For that project alone, 220 seats. That's a lot of meetings per seat. But that's what we do in Arlington and we value that. Can I just, um, add, before we go on, I'd just like to address your comments about leasing um, and tell you that we have had a study done by an independent real estate uh, consultant. And our conclusion is that it's way too expensive in terms of what's available. Um, the, the lease rates are very high in Arlington, even though we would be looking at a long-term lease. Um, and the only type of space that's available today is in office buildings. We would be much better off if we could find warehouse buildings uh, or that type of facility. They're just, no, they just don't exist in Arlington. So we pretty much come to the conclusion it doesn't make sense in this round, but we're continually looking at those options to see if things come available. So there is a, a financial analysis that shows it's much more expensive based on what's available now, maybe not less, not so in the future, but remember we don't own the building at the end of it. And we also have some issues in how we actually finance the fit up of the building to make it interesting. Yes, ma'am. Uh, thank you. Um, I would like to speak up about process that you all are now going through with all the expansions uh, to provide specifically the public facilities and <coughs> on that. And I just want to congratulate your staff, uh, Scott Risco and Aji Ola and many of the design teams. They do go through an awful lot. <laughs> we, we don't always agree with them on what the, some of the recommendations that come out. In Ashland is still a community group that came with getting a, a new ramp to do a wooded area. We don't always agree, but I just want to congratulate you. This process that you're now going through is so much better than uh, 20 years ago. And those of us who have been around for a long time, they, they have gone through the process 20 years ago where we didn't do nothing about how the, what was the rationale, what were the thinking. Uh, so this, this process, I just got to tell you, is so much better. Um, I also want to comment on the Wilson site and some of the other decisions, the recommendations that are beginning to move forward. Um, it is going in the right direction because many of us feel um, the Civic Federation has come out on this, the Planning Commission has come out on this, that we have to build up and not spread out. That we don't have more open space in woodland and recreation. And every time we spread out the new facilities, uh, we impact other. Um, we're, we're a limited community now for urbanizing, so we just got to keep going up and not, and not taking away the open space. Um, my question to you guys is, under, uh, as it relates to the Lee Highway situation, embodied in these numbers in the student uh, projections, what kind of percentage growth have you factored in along the Lee Highway corridor? And what are your assumptions here? The um, biggest issues on this corridor really are Swanson and Williamsburg Middle Schools encountering tremendous growth. Actually, it's the same cohort of students, really, that we're building the new elementary school. So those are really the, the biggest issues that we see in, in this area. But I also would like to thank you for your comments. It's very hard work, but we do feel it's worth it. I do want to echo that as well and thank our county colleagues, Walter Tejada, walked in here, and um, it is a big testament to their collaboration with us. It seems as though how it used to be is people would say, if it worked for the people, all this would be easy. Um, 
and we accept the people that be involved. So um, thank you for that. Um, I'm actually really excited about the Wilson School project. So thank you for putting that on the table. Um, I actually have two questions. First, um, can you talk about if you were to do that type of project, how would the community benefit? Um, only 14% of households are actually have children, so going with the concept of building up and not out, um, what kind of open space and free space and community the facilities do you Every, you know, um, every time I talk to colleagues in different parts of the country about how we use our schools, they're amazed at how much their collaboration and utilization of schools facility there is there is by the community. I mean, we do it without thinking about it. It's totally expected. So when we create a new facility on that site, we get a new gymnasium that can be used for different bacteria, classrooms, Media center that, that will be used by the community. So, all of that will happen inside the building. Um, we, uh, will, we, we plan and in fact, as part of the uh, Western Northern Area planning study process, wraps they call it, mm -hmm. to have open space. We anticipate that there will be at least the same size field as there is now in the back. And then, since it's an urban school, uh, is going up as uh, Karen, uh, as people are calling for, which I totally agree with. Um, we are looking at uh, putting tennis courts and basketball and you know other amenities on the roof, and we have to figure out how you can get there without going through the school and how we monitor it. But that's what happens in other cities, so there's no reason why it shouldn't. I'd also like to add on from a taxpayer perspective the benefit there. So under law, school we couldn't just sell the buildings. The county board has to to that, which is your preference. Um, the county board and the school board were in discussions, and if the county were to pay the schools for the land that now they don't have to do because we can build on our own facility, <coughs> perhaps that's money that can go to what the fire chief was talking about, things like that. So there's a benefit county-wide to the taxpayer as well that um, is making this look like a pretty attractive opportunity. I don't know who was next. Uh, I, I, I Back here, sir. Yeah. Yeah. So, uh, hi, uh, my name is Peter I'm on the uh, Parks and Recreation Commission, and uh, I also, I'm glad to see a board member here uh, to kind of help um, create some context. And John, I've seen you in several meetings. Um, so, just kind of putting a, a voice out there for open space and for uh, going to the silo busting that uh, Levy was talking about. Um, this is such a classic case where facilities could be looking at it in a silo uh, kind of way. Uh, but with people like Noah here, I think we can uh, break through that. Um, key issues uh, for me and from my perspective on the commission um, have to do with the sports facilities, uh, specifically fields. Uh, we have just a dearth of, of fields available for our children uh, here in the county, not to mention uh, adults who like to get out of the field. Uh, so I um, really encourage you to continue to uh, wrap that into your thinking. Um, we have a real problem uh, with the trailers that have gone up in several schools that have actually taken away field space. And so it just adds to the urgency of the issue that we're facing, I think. Uh, and then the only other thing would be to uh, pay attention to uh, the trees. I think somebody's stuck up with them already. Um, but the open space, Lover Run, I think, could be one example of um, how backing away from that site was partly an open space uh, question, I think. Um, so I applaud that. Um, but um, also just thinking about any case where we have construction going on, uh, where open space is being compromised, potentially uh, um, some of the larger trees in the county which are so difficult to replace. And I uh, just uh, want to put that out there. So sports facilities and, and fields, and, and then the open space as well. So thank you very much for listening to this. That's a good point. I appreciate it. Just real quickly, um, if we look at our latest, the new school of Lanesburg, uh, the new side of the hill, I mean, we know that there was that space was used, but the side of the hill a little bit more. It's a 97,000 square foot school. My understanding is it's our smallest footprint to go up rather than out to save green space, and that of course is going to be a net zero energy school, first in the Mid Atlantic region. So we have the sustainability piece associated with that as well. Sure. Well, good morning. Uh, my name is Louis Wassel, and over the last couple months, there's been a grassroots effort to kind of identify a farmer's market somewhere along the Lee Highway corridor. 
and through the grassroots discussion of the five civic associations that are kind of kind of centrally located right here, uh, two places have been identified as exploring, uh, one being the community center here, as well as possibly the parking lot that's over at Washington Lee that's hosts the uh, civic camp. So part of the question and the dialogue is one is to bring the awareness as, as us as a community to have these various elements that can essentially be placemaking centers of uh, places to come together to share uh, fresh vegetables and all that. Uh, we kind of look towards somebody as a point of contact within Arlington Public Schools to help educate us in that process. So I kind of put that on the table for this group as well as... Uh, Please uh, contact me about Okay, that would be great. Thank you. The staff gets all the homework. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Ms. Garvey? Yeah, thank yes, ma'am. Whenever three of us are in a room, we can't have a conversation because then it needs to be a public meeting. So Mr. Tahan has come. I'm going to leave. But before um, I go, I, I, I just like to circle back to where I started talking about silos. And I have been thinking for some time how important it is for the county board to sit down, or one of the school board, but I think we need as a community to sit down with one great big map and look at all the things we need. And I've been saying this for a while, and I've been taking off libraries and schools and parks, I, hospitals, I've forgotten about firehouses. So we're doing our own stone piping, and I think the more we could actually sort of follow this model and sit down and really look at things in a holistic way, the better it would be. So I've, I've been lobbying my colleagues about it. If you all think it's a good idea, let us know, because it would be good to hear from citizens, because I think that would be a very useful exercise. It would be one the whole community would participate in, because we have got a lot of needs, a limited amount of land, and we really need to get a really, really good, robust process going with a lot of planning ahead of time, just like you guys are doing. So thank you for all your good work. I will absent myself so we stay legal. Thanks, Lou. Okay. Together, Libby and I have been on the school board for 16 and a half years. Yes. So there's <laughs> 15 of them now. Thank you. Hi. Um, since land is at such a premium and looking at the 2023 element reduction, I'm just curious, are you looking, are you talking to the whole family about that land next to the on it because they let it grow. So um, we are aware of it. We do watch things like that. Um, but I would say no because we don't. Every dollar that we would spend on land acquisition would come away from seeds that we can do. So by way of example, so you know, relevant to Lee Highway is um, the office space, the office park across from the planetarium. And that's something that we looked at as well. But as John said, to get to that price tag if that owner wanted to, it, it just would take away. We wouldn't be able to build and take the money out of the capital program to buy land. Um, and again, that's what's helping make the Wilson School more attractive. But I will say, wherever we go, people come up with ideas. It, it's helpful. We've learned not to say no to things because we're going to be out of options. So if folks do have suggestions, it's helpful. Yeah, because my, I heard recently that the whole family was sort of interested in having a greater civic responsibility, maybe in pricing with some people. So, I don't know if you want to hear that. Yeah. Um, just a couple more, and then we got to run it behind. One, um, one proposal that I had seen that I didn't see on your proposals up here was um, potentially utilizing the Wilson site as a standalone Montessori school um, to take the Montessori program outside of sharing with Drew that it has been for all these years and then allowing the, the seats to open up in the fastest growing city here, uh, fastest growing part of the city down Columbia Pine. And um, I'd seen some proposals that were pretty interesting about that. With the, the other thing that we're missing about the elementary, middle, and high school is the early um, the early education piece of how many seats are we looking for for preschool. And if you could comment on that. I didn't see that here, but I had seen some proposals a while back. Sure. On the front end question, I'll take that, John, if you could take the second one. In terms of Montessori, where we are right now is the feasibility. Where can we build under our debt capacity? What is possible? 
it sounds strange, but then we let the programmatic piece come second. We've got to figure out what we can do first and then put it in. And that's a separate, it, it's another community process. The Montessori piece, I have to say, if we do a choice school in South Arlington, Montessori is one of those. And what we as the board will then look at is what instructionally is the biggest bang for the buck. We have a tremendous wait list right now for the traditional program, for the science program. Our immersion schools, our two immersion schools are bursting the seams, one of our immersion schools. Claremont will be our third largest school <coughs> next year, um, behind Taylor and Tuckahoe, while well, I guess fourth and Oak Ridge. So there's clear demand for that, and the instructional piece is what will drive that. We're just not there yet, because we're working with dollars and cents of land. Now I'll let you take a second piece. Yeah, but I think I need to take the second piece is something I need to explain. Um, the school board had previously looked at Wilson as the site for an elementary school, and it was determined that it wasn't appropriate, and we still stand by that. The best way, I think, to explain that is that's a very valuable piece of property, so we really need to maximize our utilization of it. And I apologize, you have it as a middle school. Right. Okay. But let me just explain the difference because I think it, it's important. Um, we, and people want us to go high. You can only go so high with an elementary school. Um, we would willingly build a three-story elementary school. Well, I would, I can't speak for the board, but I would be fine with a three-story elementary school. I would be fine with a four-story elementary school if the main entrance wasn't at the lowest level. You know, if it had grade level access on two levels. But I wouldn't be high, happy with anything higher than that. The middle school we're going to propose here will be higher in order to maximize the density. And the middle school has a higher seating capacity than the elementary school. So basically we can get a bigger building and bring it to the middle. In terms of the pre-K, it has always been, you know, instruction comes first. And um, our department of instruction has always been uh, very insistent that as far as possible, the pre-K students go to the school as pre-K students where they will continue through as kindergartners and first through fifth graders. And although we, because of growth, we have to have some flexibility around moving some of those classes around, simply so we can accommodate you know, grades K through five, um, it really is the intent to try and keep those pre-K students not in a center where they're all together, but to have them in the school which they will attend so they become accustomed to it and so on. Uh, I'd like to make a suggestion on community uh, involvement. Uh, we heard from the fire chief, really anxious about community involvement. Uh, using Reed School as a kind of an example, all of a sudden, within two weeks of the superintendent making a recommendation, there's a recommendation regarding Reed School, uh, which has been subject to crisis planning for the last couple of times that you've been in the school regards to the bond issue and, and things like that. Uh, there's kind of a perception that the, I know there's a number of meetings and you're tired of going to meetings, I appreciate that, uh, but information seems to flow maybe first through the PTAs and then maybe to the, uh, uh, through the school staff. I'm not sure, speaking for our neighborhood anyway, that information is coming down freely and kindly to the actual neighborhoods. Um, and you know, we shouldn't be surprised that there's a recommendation for the school coming up two weeks before a meeting. Um, and I know that there's always crises, but uh, there seems to be a, a shortcoming with regards to how you get information out. So, so let me, if I could, because I know time is short, I'll be very brief, sir. We realize that the overcrowding issue is not a school's problem, it's not a county problem, it's an Arlington issue. So what the board has done now is we've each adopted um, civic associations. We realize we need to expand our realm beyond simply PTAs, which is one of the reasons Ginger was kind enough to invite me here, because I have Cherry to help with that. So we're just starting that. We can do much better. Um, what we commit to you is to continue to improve our communication and make sure that all members of the community will be affected, have information when everybody does. It's important I, to us. I, I would warn you that civic associations is a, a handy way to go out, but communication from the civic associations to the neighbors, uh, some, some don't have very good communication uh, uh, 
uh, processes. Perhaps and, after and the this, community talk flat about out doesn't know way. what. I know more from looking at, at, at local newspapers about what the county is doing on its side than I do what what schools is. And if, if you want cooperation from the from the neighbors, you can't surprise them. Okay, well, thank you. Thank you. Well, thank you very thank much. You very much.